right? Amen. All right, well, let's jump right into it this morning. If you got your Bibles, join with me, if you will. Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2. I'm going to read 20 verses this morning. We're going to roll right through this. Luke chapter 2. If you don't have your Bibles and you want to follow along the screen, we're going to have it right up there. Reading out of the New King James Translation. New King James Translation. Luke chapter 2, verse 1 says this. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. One translation or others say taxed, registered and taxed. This census first took place while Cornelius was governor over Syria, so all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is also called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. And we know that story that Joseph and Mary uh, were engaged, and before they were married, G uh, uh, the Holy Spirit came upon Mary, and she was with child. And we know that that child was Jesus. The next verse right here, verse number 6 says, So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swallowing cloths. Cloths. My spell check this morning wanted me to change that word to clothes, but he didn't have any clothes. He didn't have any baby clothes. We had a lot of baby clothes ready for Jonas. He had no baby clothes. That word is cloths. She found some cloths, and she wrapped her baby in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Verse 9, and behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel, angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. So it was when the angels had gone away from, uh, from them into heaven that the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. Now when they had seen him, they made, they made widely known the saying which was told to them concerning the child. And all those, and what was it they heard? Glory to God in the highest, peace on earth and goodwill to morning. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. That's what they've been told. And they went out and they started, they started telling and speaking what they had seen. And all those who heard it marveled at, at those things which were told them by the shepherds. So what are these guys doing? They're going out and they're spreading the information as to what they had just encountered. And people are marveling at what they were telling them. But Mary, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. I like that word. And I looked that word up years ago, pondered them. That means she literally put things together. That word ponder means put it all together. She put, she's thinking, I remember that day, Lord, when I, you, the angel came and told me I was going to have a child. And, and I told him, I've not been with a man. I'm still a virgin. How can that be? And, and she's remembering all these things as she put all these things together in her heart. Then the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them, as it was told them. Okay, now i got a couple of questions for you. Here's the first one. Here's the first one. Let, let, let me go back into something, though, first. Here's what we find in reading that whole story. We find that with the announcement of Jesus' birth comes the announcement of the gospel. And the two can't be separated. In fact, Mark 
starts out his book by writing this, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He's starting his book. He's Mark chapter 1, verse 1. This is how he starts. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So here's reality, number one. You can't have a gospel without Jesus, right? And Jesus is the personification of the gospel. Isn't that interesting? We're going we're gonna to break that down even more. But I just want to establish that. And, 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 and the two can't be separated. But with that, here's, here's a couple of questions. Here's the first one. First question, and you're not going to be able to give me an answer, but I want you to think about this. Here's, here's the question, number one. How would you define the gospel? How would you define, if somebody came up to you today and said, hey, what is the, what is the gospel? What, what does it mean? What does the word the gospel mean? What does that mean? How would you define that? How would most believers define the gospel? If someone says, hey, what, is the, what does the word gospel mean? What does that mean? Well, I can tell you what I would have said. Uh, I, I, have to go, I have to go further back. I, I, I would have told you what I would have said at age 30 because that's when I began to discover the gospel. I grew up in church. My mom and dad were in ministry. I, I'd come from a ministry family. Uh, I was a year old when my parents left Washington and moved to Bible College in Tennessee, and, and my dad was in a series of churches that, that he was on staff at, so I grew up in church. And if you had asked me as a churchgoer, even a young person, what does, what does the gospel mean? What is the gospel? I would have just simply told you that the gospel is the message of Jesus Christ coming to this earth, God himself taking on the form of man, dying on the cross to save us from our sins so that we could go to heaven and be with him when we die and leave this earth, that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that when we leave this world, we're going to spend eternity with him in heaven. So that would have been my definition. And the truth is, that's not wrong. The truth is, it's accurate. It's accurate. But here's the second truth, that by itself... It's not complete. It's not complete. There's more to the gospel than even that. Now, let me just help you. That's the first part. And, and you know what? You could even say that's the first part. It's the best part. Amen. But, but here's my next question. Here's my next question. And so the first question is, how would you define the gospel? Second question is this. If there was more to the gospel than how you would define it, would you want to know? So if your definition was like my definition, if you would have said it just like I said it or close to it, maybe not verbatim, but close to it, if you discovered that there was more to the gospel than what you had thought or said or how you would have defined it, if, you, if, if there absolutely was more to the gospel than even that, would you want to know? Would you want to know? Now, I'm going to ask for your participation on this, okay? I'm just being straight. And you just be honest with me, okay? If there's more to the gospel than how I defined it right there and how maybe you would have defined it, if there is more to the gospel than that, in other words, if there's more that's included with the gospel, would you want to know? Now, I'm going to raise my hand. So, if that's you this morning, let me just see your hand. Would you, if there's more to, to the gospel, if there's more included, would you want to know? Now, some didn't raise your hand, and that's okay. So, what you're saying, in essence, is, and I'm not trying to embarrass you, is, I don't want to know. And that's okay. And listen, can I help you? You don't have to know. Because you got enough already, if you just got that first part, you got enough already to save your soul and get you to heaven. And, and let me help you, if that's all you want out of your Christian life is to be saved from your sins and go to heaven, then boom, you're solid. You got it. You can check that box, right? But for me and for some other, some other folks around, right, if there is more to the gospel that's included with the gospel than just me going to heaven when I die, you doggone right I want to know about it. And I want to know about every last bit of it. 
That's, that's where I'm at, okay? Now, you may not be there, and that's okay. We're going to be friends. Listen, we can agree on the majors, and that is that Jesus Christ came to die on the cross, forgive you of your sins, and give you a home in heaven. We, we, and we don't, have to, we don't have to part company. But I'm just going to say, if there's more included in the gospel than that, you better believe I want to know about it. Listen, and some of you raised your hand, you did too. And can I help you? There's, see, everybody's not coming here, okay? And that's okay. I don't expect that. And we're not here for everybody. Can I tell you who we're here for? We're here for the folks that would raise their hand and say, absolutely, if there's more included to the gospel than what I would have defined it as, I absolutely want to know about it. That's what we're here for. We're here, our mission is to help people discover the gospel. That's what we're stepping in. Part one today, all right? Part two next week, right? Here's the next one. Here's the next one. If there's more to the gospel, then how would you... Yeah, well, I got that one. Would you want to know? Yep, yep, yep. Here we go. Here we go. Let's see. Oh, here's my next one. Here's the last one. Here, or not the last one. And could that knowledge... So, so let, let's go back to something. If you believe that there's more to the gospel, or if you're open to knowing more that's included in the gospel than how you, you would have defined it. If you said, yes, I'm open to that, and, and I'm going to show you scripture after scripture in just a moment. Here's the next question. If there is more to the gospel than just getting you to heaven, then here's my next question. Could that knowledge be applicable to everyday life? Could it be, in other words, could, could that be something that could affect my life on a daily basis? Let me give you a scripture for that, John 10.10. 10. Jesus, own words, here's what he said. The enemy, who's the enemy? It's not Iraq, it's not Iran, it's not China. Now, they may be enemies, not terrorists. The enemy, who's the enemy? It's your adversary, the devil, who walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That's your enemy. Okay, that's your enemy number one. What's the greatest threat to, to the U.S.? The enemy. That's, that's the greatest threat right there. You ready? He hates you. And John 10.10, 10, Jesus says this, The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he's right. And listen, the devil is really good at being a bad devil. And he loves to kill, steal, and destroy now, thank God the verse doesn't end there, because here's the second part. Jesus says, but I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. Now, what is that more? What is this life more abundantly? What are you, what are you talking about, Lord? Well, this word life defined is the Greek word zoe, and it literally means the God kind of life. Now, what's the God kind of life like? Does the God kind of life include depression? I don't think so. I mean, you think there's any depression? Like, where would you see the God kind of life in its fullest form? Heaven, right? Do you think there's a tinge of depression in heaven? Do you think there's any sickness in heaven? Do you think there's any bankrupt lawyers, bankruptcy lawyers, advertising 1-800-BANKRUPTCY, call me today and I'll help you, or call the hurt line? Do you think there's any of that in heaven? Absolutely not. Listen, Jesus says, I've come that you may have the God kind of life. And then he says, and, that, and, and listen, and not a little. He says, and that you may have it to the full, amplified, to the full till it overflows. That's the amplified version. To the full till it overflows. Just by that one verse alone, you could surmise without being wrong that the gospel includes not only your heavenly home, but it also includes things for you here on this earth right now. Right now. Now, if that's true, I want to know all about it. Amen? Because I need as much help as I can get. Amen? Listen, I need as much help as I can get, and I want as much of God and his favor and his blessing and his life on my life as I can get. Now, if you're not with me on that, it's okay. You, you, no problem. But as for me and my house, we want all we can possibly get. Amen? And is that selfish? Is that selfish? Oh, you want all you can get? I absolutely do. 
When you go to the buffet and you pay your fourteen ninety nine, do you just eat a little bit or do you eat all you want until you're full? Some of you eat more than that. You eat past the full mark, right? But, but you don't go in there leaving hungry, do you? Now, how foolish would that be if you walked out of it and said, I am so hungry. And you, most of us walk out of it and say, I, I am so full, I ate too much. Right? Why? Because that stuff's been provided, you paid for it, and bless God, you're going, to get your, you're going to get your belly full, right? Come on, listen, listen. If Jesus paid for some things for us, he provided them for us. The Bible says, David says, God daily loads us with benefits. Would you be considered selfish if it's already been paid for? Not to take and receive everything Jesus provided for you? Absolutely not. If it's okay for the golden crowd, it ought to be okay for the kingdom of God. Amen? Or the Chinese buffet, wherever you go. Amen? You see? Now, here's my next one. Here's my next one. What is the gospel? What is the gospel? Well, and this is the easiest way. Just take a verse, find, get a concordance or a dictionary, and look up the word of the verse in the original language. If you want to know exactly what something means, right? You look it up. So I looked up this verse, gospel, in blueletterbible.com. I love using that website. It's a great online tool, concordance, le a lexicon, everything you can eat. Blueletterbible.com. I look up, I just type in the word gospel, and it gives me every verse that has the word gospel in it, Okay. And, and, here, and it shows you the word defined. It gives you the, the, the word in the Greek because the New Testament was written in the Greek. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Yungelion. Uh, Yungelion is how you pronounce it in Greek. Yungelion is the word for the gospel in the Greek. And here's, it has three meanings. You ready? A, it means good tidings. Good tidings. B, it means the glad tidings of salvation through Christ. And C, it means the proclamation of the grace of God manifest and pledged in Christ. Wow, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Now, now listen, there are two definitions for gospel. And there's a definition pre-cross and there's a definition post-cross. See, when, Paul, when, when the Apostle Paul says the word gospel, he's saying it from a from my understanding that it, it, it includes some things that had not happened before Jesus went on the cross. It includes some things, right? Listen, when Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are talking about the gospel, or even Jesus himself is talking about the gospel, he's talking about it even pre-cross. So the pre-cross definition, let me help you with that. Pre-cross definition means glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And what does the kingdom of God mean to find? It means God's way of doing and being. The glad tidings of the kingdom of God, listen, soon to be set up and subsequently also of Jesus the Messiah, the founder of this kingdom. So that's talking about something that's coming, right? Post-cross, here's what it means. After the death of Christ, the term compromises also the preaching of concerning Jesus Christ as having suffered death on the cross to procure eternal salvation for the men of the kingdom of God. And that word men could be defined as people. So here, let me break it down even further. Good tidings literally means to bring good news or to announce glad tidings. We don't use the word tidings in the original, in, in, in our English language. Old English, in, in, in England and Europe, the word tidings was a common word, and the word tidings means news, news. So basically, here's what you got. The, the word gospel literally means what? Good news, good news. Now I want to give you four quick truths about the gospel. Before we close, number one, the gospel, this good news, was then and is now for everyone. It's for everyone. In fact, the Apostle Paul said it this way in Romans 1.16. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, 
For it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who goes to church every Sunday. For everyone who gives 10% of everything that they have come in. No. Listen, listen. It's the power of God to salvation for everyone who lives right according to the good book and follows the Ten Commandments. No. Here's what it says. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. It's that simple. It says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. And just to make sure he's got everybody covered, here's what he says. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. And what does the word Greek mean? You may not be Greek. But that word Greek means Gentile, non-Jew. So here's what he's saying. The gospel is for everyone. Now, let me tell you what else he said in here. And I'm not ashamed of it. Now, let me just help you on something. For those that didn't raise your hand, I appreciate you being honest, right? This sounds a little confrontational, doesn't it? You know, let's be real. Come on, let's just get real, amen? Let me help you with something. If I'm right, and you're wrong, and the gospel also includes some things along with it that, that, that goes beyond just you getting to heaven, if that's included in the gospel, and you don't believe it, that means you're ashamed of it. Wow. You ain't got to put it like that, bro. It's the truth. If the gospel really includes more than how you would have defined it, but you're resistant to the gospel... That means you're ashamed of it. And that means you're not going to do what those, the, those shepherds did. What did they do? They experienced the gospel, and then they went and told others about it who marveled also. Isn't that interesting? Listen, I don't want to be ashamed or resistant to anything that God has ordained, created, or that he's behind. I mean, think about it. I mean, do you want to be on the side of him or not? I want to be on his side. I want to be on his I want to be on his, I want to be on team Jesus. Right? And if team Jesus has some things that are included that maybe I didn't understand, you know what? Praise God and let me learn because whatever you say, Lord, is what I'm going to go with. Amen. That that's where he wants our hearts to be. Now, can I can I help you with something? Religion is stiff. And it bristles. Can I help you? And religion doesn't like the gospel. It resists the gospel. It was religious people that hung Jesus on the cross and crucified him. That's who hung him on the cross. They were so resistant and hated this concept of the gospel. That they sought to crucify, they looked for every opportunity they could find to crucify him. What is religion? Jesus defined it as having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And, and Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. That's interesting, isn't it? You know, and those questions I was asking one, while ago, one I thought about, but I didn't ask. If the gospel really includes more than just us going to heaven when we die, do you think our adversary, the devil, would want us to know about it? Absolutely not. And if so, would he use every means necessary even to include religion to keep you from knowing that truth? Absolutely. How can you say that? Because that's where I grew up. I'm just being honest with you. That's where I grew up. I grew up hearing one piece of the gospel, but not the complete gospel. And guess what? He, Jesus says, you can't have faith unless you hear. He says, they can't hear unless someone tells them. The gospel has to be believed. I was 30 years old when I began to hear the complete gospel. And so guess what? It's my life's mission. And the Lord told me, he said, here's your assignment. I want you to be a bridge, and I want you to help take people from where you were to where I want them to be. Now, not everybody's going to come. Not everybody even wants to go. I get it. I understand that, right? But for those who are hungry, for those that say, God, if there's more, I want to know. 
I want your life to be a bridge. This is your mission. I want you to be a bridge. You're not going to be a holy roller church. Everybody ain't going to be falling down in the floor. You're going to have order. You're going to believe the whole gospel. But you're going to be a bridge to help people get from over here to knowing very little about the good news to getting on this side of knowing about my good news in its completeness. And that's when he led me down the road of, of understanding the word saved, which is the Greek word sozo, S-O-Z-O. has seven meanings. And it means to be saved, healed, delivered, preserved, protected, and to be made whole. Saved, healed, delivered, preserved, protected, made prosperous, and made whole. I left out one. I didn't even feel right when I said it because I knew I'd left something out. It includes all seven aspects, which the first one being saved covers your forgiveness of sin and giving you eternal life in heaven. The other six has to do with your life here on this earth while you're here. Wow. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? You better believe the devil doesn't want you to know this. You know why? Because the more you know, listen, the more you know, the deadlier you become to his kingdom. And what's his kingdom about? Steal, kill, and destroy. And what's Jesus' kingdom about? Life and life more abundantly. And, and that's why he doesn't want us to know this. Your adversary, the devil, who walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, hey, he can't devour everybody, but he can devour some. And who's he devouring? Well, Jesus says, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. So that just tells me I want to know everything I could possibly know about the gospel and the good news. To enjoy in this life to the full till it overflows, but to also share with others. Amen? Do you think that a loving heavenly father that uses gold as street payment in heaven doesn't care about your everyday life on this earth? How foolish is that? He cares about every aspect of your life here on this earth and even has, just to show you how crazy he is about it, he's got every hair on your head numbered. He's got your name tattooed in the palm of his hand. That's what he thinks about you. That's what he thinks about you. The gospel's for everyone. Number two, listen. The gospel received changed people's everyday lives. We see this in Scripture. Now, if the, if the gospel was only about getting you to heaven, then that's what the message would be about only, right? But here's what, it, here's what happened. Look, verse uh, number two, the gospel received changed people's everyday lives. I'm going to give you some verses. Mark 4, 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Wow, as he went out taking this good news, this gospel, healing came to people as he traveled. Isn't that amazing? Mark 9, 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Wow, that's the second verse. Here's the next one, Mark eleven five. 5. The blind received their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Wow. The first ones to receive the announcement of the gospels were the shepherds. They were the lowest level of society in their day. Shepherds. That was the, that was the welfare system of their day, that if you couldn't Maintain a living, you could at least go out there and stay all night with the sheep and watch the sheep. And they were the lowest of the low. And the good news came to them first. Isn't that, isn't that powerful? Look at this, Luke 9, 6. And they departed, and these are the disciples, not just Jesus. And they departed and went through the towns preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Everywhere. And this continued, continued in the book of Acts. It continued through Paul's life and ministry. Paul, Peter, Philip, I mean, on and on. And Jesus says, listen, these signs will follow them that believe in my name. You'll lay hands on the sick and the sick will recover. And he just gives a, a litany of the things that will follow those that believe the gospel. Sounds like to me it includes more than just going to heaven. 
And Jesus demonstrated it everywhere he went. Here's what the Apostle Paul said. I'm just quoting. Paul said in one of his writings, he says, I didn't come to you in men's speak or in fancy words. He said, but when I came to you, I came in power, in the power and the demonstration of the Holy Spirit. He demonstrated the kingdom of God, just like Jesus did, the Apostle Paul did when he went out and preached the gospel. He demonstrated what the kingdom of heaven looked like. Let me give you this last one, or this third one. The gospel must be shared and taught. Must be shared and taught. Mark 16, 15, these are Jesus' words. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, the good news, to every creature. And then he says, And these signs will follow them that believe. And he told, he told us what would happen in his name. And here's my last point. The gospel is simple. It's not complicated. It's simple, yet it's complete. It's simple, it's easy to understand, and it's completely cover, it completely covers every area of your life starting right here on this earth right now. Amen? Here's the verse for that, two verses, John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the same words found in John 10.10, 10, an abundant life, Zoe life. Verse 17, for God sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, which is the word sozo, and means saved, healed, delivered. Preserved, protected, made prosperous, and made whole. It's that simple. Now, can I ask you a question? Why would anybody not like that? I don't get it. I, I, I just don't get it. Like, why would, you, why would that make you mad? Why, why would that make somebody mad that Jesus came to cover every area of your life to get you to heaven and to give you an abundant life here on this earth? Why would that make somebody mad? Why would someone argue? Why, what are you saying? We're going, I'm going to live on, in a mansion on the river and drive a Bentley? No, I'm not saying that. Because this word prosper mean, means fully supplied in need or want of nothing. In need or want of nothing. Parents, if your child goes to school tomorrow and they go into that classroom disheveled, hairs in a mess, dried boogers coming all out of their nose, come on, let's be honest with you. Let's hungry, haven't eaten, haven't eaten, clothes are tattered and dirty. And you got a call from the principal's office. Let's just be honest. Listen, how would that reflect on you as a parent? Horrible. Do you think that your heavenly father cares about you and your everyday life? Do you think that you, listen, you, you living in a way that, glory, that, 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 you living in a way that keeps you fully supplied and need or want of nothing is good or bad when it comes to him? It's good. It's great. He's given us everything we need, the Bible says, for life and for godliness. This is part of the gospel. It just has to be believed and accepted. I'm, I'm not trying to invent something. I promise you I'm not. I can give you scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture. I can show you what Jesus did. I can show you what the disciples did. I can show you what others did through scripture. And it is that simple. But yet many believers have never completely discovered the gospel. And listen, and we needlessly go lacking and suffering because of it, to the hurt of heaven. That hurts the, the, the Father's heart. Listen, when he has supplied us and given us everything we need for life and godliness, but yet we, 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 we've never received. Either we've never received because we've never heard, or we've heard it and we stiffen up from religion, a religious spirit, and we say, I don't blah, 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 blah. Either way, it hurts his heart. Here's what I want to throw out to you today. Let's discover the gospel and live life more abundantly. That's his desire for you and me. It starts with knowing that you've got a home in heaven. 
That's where peace comes in. Knowing that everything's been made right between you and the Father and that you've been made righteous because of Jesus' sacrificial atonement on the cross. And that from that, you and I get to enjoy Him in our lives every single day. Showing up when and where we need Him. And even in, at times and in places where we don't even know we need Him. And having that relationship with Him. Because that's how much He loves us. It's that simple. Because He loved us so much that He gave His only begotten Son. Not to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved, might be saved. It's that simple. It's that simple. It's that simple. It's that simple. God wants us to discover the gospel in its purest form. Its purest form. Not diluted, not watered down, but in its complete and purest form. And that's our mission. That's what we're here to do. Amen. So you know what? We're just going to preach the gospel. And we're going to let the Lord bring in who he wants to bring in. Amen. But I just know that where the gospel is preached and people receive it, the gospel changes lives. Listen, the gospel received, just like it changed those lives, would change yours. Amen.